This video is sponsored by Volusion, the all-in-one solution for selling online with your very own online store. Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and it is now time for part two of the Galaxy S6 and the S6 Edge review. So let's go ahead and get into it, and if you'd like to see part one, please see the link in the description so that you can get to that. So let's go ahead and check it out. Again, I want to thank AT&T for loaning me two of these phones here so that I could compare them to my own. This is the T-Mobile variants versus the AT&T variants. This has been for performance purposes, and everything is of my own opinion. I'm not being paid or anything to talk about their phones and compare it to mine. Completely objective. So the first thing that I'd like to start talking about in part two of this review is the battery life. We have a slightly, minusculely bigger battery in the Edge. 2,600 milliamp hours versus 2,550. Unfortunately, these batteries are locked in unless you want to pry up these back covers. There's a lot of adhesive that's strong in holding it in place. Then you'd have to take the phone apart a bit to get down to the battery. So it is not end user serviceable, but it is possible to remove that battery. It's just not something that the faint of heart are gonna want to do. What is nice about this phone is that we do have fast charging and that fast charging does work very fast and very reliably. I can confirm indeed that within 30 minutes it charges 50% and it's really a lifesaver. So if you're somebody who is at home a lot, or maybe if you work from home or if you are at a desk where you can plug your phone in, the fact that this has a really small battery isn't so bad because of how fast it does charge. You also have the ability to put it on a wireless charging mat, that's nice. It's true that none of these features make up for a smaller battery, but I think that it makes it a little bit less painful. But the most painful thing I think was seeing the Active come out, the S6 Active having a 3,500 milliamp hour battery inside of it. That's nearly a full 1,000 milliamp hours different. So it's a choice here. Do you want the slim and pretty and all glass-like, or do you want the larger Active that doesn't have the look of this phone? It doesn't have the fingerprint scanner. You've got physical buttons on it. It's a bit more bulky. So that's just going to come down to preference. Now on both of these phones, these are phones from different carriers and I have been using them on their respective carriers, T-Mobile, AT&T. I'm noticing that it's getting about the same battery life. This was on the 5.0.2 update. So I was getting four hours of on-screen time pretty much. Sometimes I would hit four and a half hours of on-screen time, but really the rule was about four hours for me. I keep the brightness at about 50%. There you can see there, 3% in four hours and 28 minutes. Here we have another time where here's three hours and 58 minutes. We've got four hours and eight minutes. So for me, four hours has been pretty much a constant I hear some people getting a little bit better than that, some people getting five hours, some people saying that they get five and a half hours. At that point, I think that you probably have a custom ROM or something on this thing because it does seem to be quite a bit of a battery hog. The battery can last me through an entire day, so a 14 hour day, that is with that four hour screen time on mark. Or I was able to get through over a 20 hour day. This is with about three hours of on screen time. So it lasts, but if you're going to be using it heavily, I expect to charge it at least once through the day. In terms of how the battery is lasting now on this newest update, it's a little bit hard to say. Some people are praising it, saying that I'm getting a full hour longer of on-screen time. And others are saying, oh my gosh, now my battery is draining horrifically. And I haven't had this update long enough to really tell, but what I do know is that with these updates that we have so far, we're not at the full peak performance of what I'd like to see with this. I want to see the battery life optimized a little bit better. One thing I did notice after the update is that my Edge is getting hot very, very quickly. Before, I could be using it for a little bit of time, and after a while, it would get warm or hot depending on what I was doing with it but now it seems to be heating up and I have to restart it to get it to stop doing this thing that's making it heat up. I don't really know what's going on with it. I think I'm going to have to do a hard reset, a factory reset. I don't feel like troubleshooting. Once you do an update it's good to do a factory reset anyway and I admittedly didn't do that so I will do that and see how this turns out. The one thing I'm really curious about is how this is going to perform once we get the Android M update. I don't know when that's going to be. But the overall thing that I notice is that the battery life is just okay. If you are someone who is going to be using this on the web a lot, if you're going to be taking a lot of pictures, if you're going to be playing games, 
All those things I noticed heavily drain the battery. Of course, graphic intensive gameplay drains the battery, but the camera does really drain the battery as well and it gets super hot underneath the camera. That's on both of these devices. So that is the light that I have to shed right now on the battery. It's just okay, nothing impressive. Now before I forget, we also have a power saving mode and an ultra power saving mode. I don't usually rely on the power saving mode. I don't feel that it makes all that much of a difference for me, but you do have the option. So you can see that it says here, save battery by limiting the maximum CPU performance, reducing screen brightness and frame rate, turning off the touch key light, turning off vibration feedback, and reducing the time before the screen is turned off when notifications are received. So it just makes some tweaks for you and you can choose for it to be on immediately, 5%, 15%, 20%, 50%. This is after hitting these marks as the battery is draining. A mode that I really do like though is this ultra power saving mode. Once you turn it on, it's going to turn everything to grayscale and really make the usage very minimalistic. So by default, you have three of these apps that are sitting here, phone, messages, internet, then you can add a couple more. So we have access to calculator, clock, Facebook, memo, Twitter, voice recorder, WhatsApp, and Google+. It's strange to me that there is no Google Hangouts, but there is access to Google+. That's weird. At least we have WhatsApp. So this can last me roughly 1.6 days at 74%. I can still browse the internet and I can even still watch YouTube videos if I want to. So mildly functional and should last a long time. So if you find yourself without being able to charge it and you're sitting at only 20% battery, do yourself a favor and turn this on. So now let's move on to connectivity and all that good stuff. So first, of course, we need to say that this is a phone and it works quite well as a phone. It makes phone calls just fine. People can hear me just fine. The speakerphone gets nice and loud. All of it works very, very nicely. The only issue that I come across is that this doesn't have the best reception of all the phones that I have tested. So I have two different SIMs. I have a T-Mobile SIM and an AT&T SIM. This is the T-Mobile variant of the phone. So when I put the T-Mobile SIM into this, it really doesn't do very well at all for reception. Right now it's in airplane mode because I get sounds of interference from the LTE with the microphone. It doesn't sound very nice, but I'll show you. So I'm bouncing between one tiny bar or two bars. And it's to the point where it sounds garbled for people who call me while I'm in my apartment. It drops calls. It goes right to voicemail for some people. Data speed is horrifically slow. It's basically unusable. But when I take the SIM out and I put it into the M9, it does fine. It's not still great reception, but I do get a lot more reception on the M9 using the T-Mobile SIM than this one. Here I have the AT&T version of the phone, and I've been using it for a while here, and it's not getting great reception either. It's a little bit more usable, I notice, than the T-Mobile SIM, but it's not very good reception. And then of course, when I put the AT&T SIM into the M9, I get better reception as well. So it's just a constant that I'm seeing. So if you're someone who lives in a very low signal area, I don't think that this phone is going to do you much justice. Try it out. And if there's anyone who has this phone already, please give me your feedback. Let me know if you're also experiencing the same issues. But as for everything else, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, GPS has been working just fine for me. I'm able to get a fix. It seems pretty accurate. Bluetooth has been just a gem, works just fine, connecting it to my stereo, no problems. Wi-Fi has been good. I haven't really had much issue with Wi-Fi. Once in a while, I notice that it will drop the Wi-Fi and then reconnect. It's not been something that's really annoying, but I see other people reporting that as well. I haven't really noticed it yet quite with this update, so we'll have to see if it keeps doing that. Overall, it's been a pretty good experience, except for if you're someone who lives in a really low signal area, pay attention to that. It doesn't get the best of reception. Now let's move on to talking about the speaker quality. We've got this one speaker here that's on the bottom. Of course, my favorite type of speakers are going to be the ones that are on the front, like with the M9. And then we've also got speakers like this on the G4 that are on the back. Now, I can't stand the ones that are on the back sometimes because I'm blocking it. If I'm just holding it like this all the time, I'm blocking it. I still block this one if I am playing games. If I'm holding it just right on the edges, I block it as well. But at least if I cup my hands like this, I can kind of amplify the sound a little bit at my face. So it's not all bad. The quality is decent. It does get really nice and loud. 
I noticed that when I put the volume all the way up on some songs, it gets really quite scratchy. There's a lot of distortion, so I keep it one button below the full volume. It works really great for speakerphone. It does just what it needs and really no more. Please don't expect it to be like the likes of speakers that are on the front, like with the M9. Decent enough quality. Sounds pretty good. Sounds a little harsh to me sometimes, but good enough. So now I'd like to take a second to thank my sponsors over at Volusion.com so much for making content creation possible. They are an all-in-one e-commerce solution. Volusion provides you with everything that you need in order to build a successful online store. So I've been thinking of selling some of my reviewed phones and I think that Volusion is a great way to do that. I really don't want to sell things on eBay or Craigslist. I kind of want something that's more personalized. A lot of you guys ask me what in the world I do with all these phones after I'm done reviewing them. A lot of them I hold on to for future reference, but the other ones just kind of sit around. So I think that it might be fun to sell them. If you all want to have a chance to get your hands on them, that could be an idea. That's something that I've been toying with. In addition to offering intuitive and easy to use tools to help you build an online store, they also offer solutions to manage and grow a successful online business. These include marketing, web design, SEO, and many other things. They also have the option for you to consult their professional services if you really need help perfecting your online business or really just want them to look to see what you need to improve on. They have an Android and an iOS application so that you can manage your website anytime, anywhere. Now it's also really cool that they've just made Volusion compatible with Android Wear so you can check things on the go. They have free personalized live support 24 seven with a live person. And it's also really nice that your site will look great on your website as well as on mobile devices like tablets and smartphones. So learn more and try it free at volusion.com. You can have a 14 day free trial if you follow the link down in the description. There is no credit card required or anything like that. So if you're somebody who's been wanting to start selling your merchandise or whatever it is, I think that Volusion offers a really great solution to do this. A lot of people don't know where to start. There's too many things and everything is just all in one here. So really check them out and let me know what you guys think. Now let's get on to talking about the camera. We've got a 16 megapixel sensor here on the front. There's a five megapixel sensor, 1.9 aperture lens. We've got optical image stabilization. Unfortunately, the glass that's on here, this cover glass is not made out of sapphire. It just seems to be Gorilla Glass and it can crack quite easily if it hits just right down on that camera. So try to protect and guard your camera because you do see that it protrudes quite a bit there. We were met with a lot of controversy and some disappointment when people found out that the camera sensors are not all the same. Some of them have the Sony IMX240 sensor and some of them have Samsung's ISOCELL sensor. Now all of the images that I've taken we're on this one here. This is my edge unit from T-Mobile and this has the Sony sensor. There is a way to check for that. Unfortunately, once you get the update, you're not going to be able to check anymore. So if you have not been updated yet to 5.1.1, you're still on 5.0.2. Take this number combination that you see here, star pound 3497539 pound. Keep in mind, I've heard this doesn't work on the Verizon version. So well, let's copy this and we're going to go to the dialer and we're going to paste this here. Now you go down to ISP version check and I can see right here that this is the ISOCELL sensor otherwise it would say the Sony sensor on here so this is the ISOCELL version. You can tell the difference between the two sensors. There are some minute differences. In general, out in daily life, you're probably not really going to notice a difference. Sometimes I see a difference in the sky colors. The Sony sensor looks more bluish. But the difference that I really see is in night shots. That's where it became immediately obvious that this has the Sony sensor, where this is the ISOCELL one. I do see that pictures from the ISOCELL sensor do have a little bit more light or they seem to have a tiny bit more detail, especially in shadow regions in darker images and low light settings. But what I can really see between the Sony and the ISOCELL is that there's kind of a pinkish look to areas in the ISOCELL pictures where the Sony one doesn't. It's nice and looks black, it looks like it should. So even if you did get the update and you can't check with that code I showed you, you can go outdoors and you can check to see at nighttime if you got kind of that pinkish cast on your image, you'll know that that is the ISOCELL sensor, not the Sony one. So the images that I'm going to be showing you are from the Sony sensor. I don't think that this is such a huge deal that there are differences between these. They perform both 
about the same. So let me know what your opinion on that is. Oh, and by the way, there is no predictor of which sensor that you have until you actually check the phone or check the pictures or deal with EXIF data or do whatever, because here we have the Edge variant for AT&T. We hit ISB version check and it says that this is the Sony sensor. So here we have the ISOCELL sensor, here we have the Sony sensor and another Sony sensor. It has nothing to do with both being an Edge. It really does seem to be Almost at random. It's not like the United States has all Sony sensors and Europe has all ISOCELL or anything like that. I think it's just going to come down to chance and you just have to check for yourself and see if you like your images. But most people are really not even going to notice and it's going to be a non-issue. I'm sure Samsung is banking on that. So before we move on to talking about image quality, let's talk about the camera application that they have here. If you double tap on the home button here. It's going to open up the camera in less than a second, which is a really great feature of this camera. So we have received the 5.1.1 update and a lot of us were expecting to see the camera 2 API features such as shutter speed, lower ISO. We also wanted to see the ability to save in RAW. Unfortunately, underneath their application, you don't have the ability to do this. But we do have the ability to use those features. We just need to have an application that supports the Camera 2 API features so we can use the third-party app. This is Camera FV5. Now, I really sincerely hope that all of these features are put inside of Samsung's app eventually. I really hope that Samsung gets that done because I don't like using third-party apps. But you can see here that we've got the ability to choose our shutter speed. So we have half a second, and then you see one eight thousandth of a second here we have the ability to choose lower ISO. I believe in the Galaxy S6's app, it's only between ISO 100 and ISO 800. So here you have ISO 50 and ISO 1600 that you can choose manually yourself now. Then of course, we have the ability to enable DNG raw capture. So those features are there, although they're really not as impressive to me as what we have on the LG G4 because we get even more settings, especially in regards to shutter speed. I really love the low light pictures that I can take with the G4. Underneath the shutter speed you can see I can go all the way up to keeping the shutter open for 30 seconds. That's great. I've been taking a lot of low light images on 2, 4, and 8 seconds and have been getting really great results. So unfortunately the Galaxy S6 doesn't have that ability, but you do have some ability to mess around with that shutter speed. That gives you some artistic integrity. The thing that we did get for an update on this phone is if you Play something there. Let's go ahead and tap on it. You can barely see it, but you've got this ability to focus on what you want, and then you can adjust this little slider here to adjust the exposure on the thing that you had focused on. So that's nice, I guess. I really want to see more features. So now let's take a look at the camera interface. I think that this is the best camera interface that Samsung has done so far. It feels very simplified and very easy to understand. Before they had just things kind of everywhere and wasn't very intuitive. So let's just start with this left hand side here. So you see that you can get rid of all of these settings here, although it still warns you that HDR is on. So we have the ability for effects. We have the ability to turn HDR auto on and off. There's the timer, the flash, and then there is settings as well for the camera. So we've got picture size, which is 16 megapixels. The aspect of the sensor is 16.9, then if you want a 4.3 crop it's going to put it down to 12 megapixels. But here are the rest of these sizes respectively. So here we have our video sizes. We have UHD, QHD, Full HD, 60 frames per second. This is really excellent and looks really nice. The G4 doesn't have the option for 60 frames per second at all. So I give the edge definitely to the S6 here. So we also have a 1080p 30 frames per second option. We've got a 720p and VGA. Now keep in mind, these things are going to be disabled during any of these modes. The following will be unavailable while recording in UHD, QHD, FHD 60 frames per second. So with all these modes, you don't get HDR, you don't get any of the video effects, you don't get stabilization, you don't get taking pictures while recording video, and you don't get tracking autofocus. Wow, okay. So the best thing to get all of these effects is going to be purely with video that's at 1080p, 30 frames per second. So you see that there's tracking autofocus that we can use at 1080p, 30 frames per second. We've also got video stabilization. You can see that when the tracking autofocus is on, that we can't use video stabilization. 
So tracking autofocus is kind of cool. You can see as I move this around that it's trying to make sure that it stays. Oop. And sometimes it gets lost and it really doesn't know where it goes. But that's still a nice effort. So with video stabilization, there's two different things. You've got the optical image stabilization, and then you've also got their digital image stabilization that works on top of it. It's going to crop the frame. I think that together it looks pretty wobbly in itself. I end up just keeping the video stabilization off. And you've got the rest of the things here, grid lines, location tags, la la la, la 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 your standard fare. And of course we've got mode. I really love what they've done here. Everything's very concise, easy to see, not a bunch of colors that interfere and kind of distract me. So you've got the auto mode, pro mode, selective focus that we've been seeing on the Galaxy S5, panorama, slow motion, fast motion, virtual shot, and download. You can download more things into this application. So let's go ahead and look at the pro mode and what we have here. Now, as I was trying to explain with LG G4, there's a lot more pro features that you can use. I hope that they update this camera application. So in addition to the things that we have here on the left, we have the ability to do manual focus. So you can go to macro or infinity. You have the ability to adjust the white balance. You can mess around with the ISO. You can see it only goes between 100 and 800 manually. Then you've got your exposure compensation. So there isn't anything else in here. It's just a very, very standard type of pro mode, nothing real impressive. Now, of course, before I forget, we've got a couple things up here. Standard, you can choose these different modes here. These are just kind of pre-selected filters. You can save your own custom settings as well. So you've got option for three settings. You can just save those presets and use them at will. And of course, we've got our front-facing camera. This is a five megapixel front-facing camera, hello. There's a gaggle of settings under here, which is really cool. So we've got effects. We've got HDR, which we can keep on auto. So we have auto HDR with the front facing camera. We've also got this live beauty slider thing. Then underneath settings, you can see that we've got five megapixels, it's a four, three crop. Then for video size, we have the option for QHD, 1080p, full HD. Then you've got HD, VGA. And then it tells you the things that won't be available if you choose to use the QHD resolution. So we've got gesture control where you can hold your hand up. So if it sees your hand, it will take a selfie for you. What's also nice is that we have digital image stabilization here for video on the front, so it's not all shaky. I've tried it without the video stabilization and it is quite shaky, so I would recommend using it. Grid lines, location tags, review pictures, and all that good stuff. So a very, very powerful little camera that we have here. One of the best interfaces that I've seen and I really like it. Now in terms of image quality, I think that this is a really great little point and shoot. I think that the colors come out really nice, although I notice that they're a little bit oversaturated. There is a warmer white balance, which I tend to like. And I really do like the dynamic range that we have, and the HDR feature does put that a step above as well. So let's go ahead and look at some pictures that I've taken and some video as well, and you can let me know what you think. So let's go ahead and check those out.
So this is, without video stabilization, it's a uh, autofocus. You can see just how beautiful the push is. This is one of my favorite places to come. So, we're going to walk up this log. Probably very scary. Are you saying giggity? No! Go away! <laughs> Alright, resuming the log. Mm, very far down. They are pretty. It's a beautiful day. I do say so much though. We've got some cabins. Down there, are lots of rocks. See, see, we are up pretty far. Walk all the way down there. It's very tall tree trunk. Very, very careful. Right and it's actually not slippery. There's the best view from up there. Just need a new one. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Please let me know what you think of the Galaxy S6. As I mentioned in part one of this video, I would rate this one of my top five favorites alongside the LG G4. I think this is a very attractive little phone. It feels great in hand, especially the Galaxy S6. The edge is interesting, looks fun. It has some fun gimmicky features, but it just doesn't compare in feeling to the Galaxy S6. It's much easier to hold. All of this is going to be up to your own opinion and you can say in the comment section below which one that you prefer. Great display, really nice that we have the fingerprint scanner now or fingerprint sensor. Not so great battery life, but really nice with the quick charging.
So let me know what your favorite features are of these phones and if you would go for the S6 or maybe even the Active. I have enjoyed my time playing around with these phones. Thanks AT&T for sending these out to me so I can compare them with my own again. And have a good night, everybody.